Mirror Universe Nog doesn't trust tall men. Jake gets to meet his mom all over again. And the Terrans might not have enough troops or ships or weapons, but they have plenty of captains. Hey, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. We're also joined by a very special guest, Melissa Longo. It's a Nog episode, everybody. Yay! And Mochi's butt, of course. <laughs> My name is Ryan T. Hus. Today we are doing a review of Deep Space Nine's season four, Shattered Mirror, directed by James L. Conway and written by Ira Stephen Bear and Hans Beimler. That's different. We usually say Ira and Robert Hewitt Wolf. So yeah. that's a fun combination there. How are you guys doing? Yeah. All right. <laughs> I'm doing well. There he is. <laughs> He's you building know, up the suspense. Yes, Mirror Universe Garrick is trying to hack my signal, so <laughs> he knows we're doing the Shattered Mirror episode. Yeah. So uh, real quick, we got a shout out for the Voyager documentary. All three of us are involved with the Voyager documentary, Indiegogo. Uh, it's going to have a really cool uh, away mission with uh, Starfleet Academy. We're going to talk about Cadet Nog, everybody's favorite Cadet, also maybe Cadet Nicholas Locarno, who was played by uh, Robert Duncan McNeil. There's so many Roberts in Voyager. Uh, Robbie Duncan McNeil, who also ended up playing Tom Paris. But check out the Indiegogo for the Voyager documentary. It's going to be huge. It's the same people, 455 Films, that did what we left behind, the greatest documentary in history. So they got big, big, yeah, big yeah. shoes to fill. Mm -hmm. 455 yeah we will include the link in the description box below and you will check it out because it is glorious we love the team we love what they do and we love voyager anyway yes we do. yes we do <laughs> <Get another woo -hoo. laughs> let's start to celebrate and you First know what it's women's first. history month so what a perfect right. time to launch a, a, a voyager uh, documentary and get it off the ground at this point. So I think everybody who's you know listening should support because we had our first female captain who really represented well for the culture. So I want to give her support, give her love too. Yeah, it's a great point. Women's History Month. And by the way, the uh, the campaign is doing beautifully. It is aces. It's doing really well. So jump on that train. Yeah. Uh, awesome. First things first, though, Nog doesn't like tall men. He was very ah. clear about that. <laughs> tall women, however. <laughs> right. To, uh, tall women, however, is a different story. Um, mm. Yeah, you would have think you would have thought he would have let me know that by now. I just, I just <laughs> it, uh, took a while. It took a while to figure that out, but. Uh, I like Mirror Universe Nog in this episode. I think he's just, he gets to really unload a lot of the, the things that he's really great at. And that's uh, his humor when he wants to be brash about his humor. I feel like that was on display in this episode. What do you yeah. think, Lily? Yeah. Uh, I, it was. Uh... <laughs> She's busy playing with her kitty. Sorry. <laughs> Avoiding her because she, <laughs> she she likes to attack my limbs right now, so I'm hiding them <laughs> um, because I'm not paying attention to her. Anyway, no, I liked to see this side of Nog because we don't get to see this side of him, and he does it very well. Mm -hmm. He definitely carries himself differently and speaks differently. His voice is deeper and more yeah he's more brash he actually seemed yeah. more like a Ferengi right yeah. like he just felt more Ferengi mm -hmm. he was just kind of crotchety and grumpy and in your face like you better watch it I want to make my money get the heck my favorite yeah. line uh probably of the entire episode was when you go like hey look this is my dad he goes he's tall too <laughs> like that, he just yelled <laughs> he's tall too and that's it uh that was pretty that was pretty solid um bummer about his ending because it would be cool to have him throughout yeah. but he is the master of his domain until then he is mm -hmm. the master of that bar and the promenade and all that so that's definitely like 
that particular character's dream realized. Yeah, yes, he is the owner of his castle, the ruler of his castle. <laughs> that is for sure. Yeah, sorry about that. It's all right. Yeah. We're just talking about Nog being running in his own bar because Rom and Quark had been killed both by the intendant. Well, you know, the thing about it, too, is they also wardrobe wise, they changed, they changed, like he was wearing some different stuff. He had the collar with the jacket kind oh. of like work. Yeah, it was so nice. I was like, ah, oh, that's such spiffy outfit he's wearing. It was a spiffy uh, and a, a more affluent outfit to what he yeah. normally wears. Like he normally wears, I guess, like the casual Ferengi attire. Mm -hmm. But in, in this particular <laughs> one, he was wearing the more dressed up you know, sophisticated with the collar and the three-piece kind of look, kind of how Cork usually dresses mm -hmm. um, when he's when he's dressed up. Yeah, definitely like yeah. his jacket. He also had, I also too um, had his, my favorite line was his line, um, but it came a little bit at a different point than when you mentioned Ryan. Which one was that? Uh, this was when the two of us were on the uh, promenade and I'm at the usual, our usual hangout chill spot. Oh, and I, like I love that moment. Uh, so, but Nog comes up and he's like, hey, you know, you're irritating me. Can you get the hell out of here? That's all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you think somewhere else? Yeah. You're, you're bothering me, right? And, and Jake's um, all nostalgic. He's like, Oh, oh boy, no. oh boy, you know, you, this is our place. And he's just like, well, let me get the fuck out of yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I bring up to the, yeah, I bring up, I'm like, you know, usually you're the one hanging out with me. Now you're kicking me out. And, it, and he's like, am I supposed to be impressed by that? And he, he does this when he, when he wants to get into like being a jerk mode in a comical yeah. way, he's so good at it. And he just flipped the switch. And so then I, I'm, I hit him with, yeah, I'll take off. I'm leaving. And my favorite line of the episode was, I'm waiting. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. I I'm literally re -re I rewound it like five to six times. I just had to uh, hear him say it over and over again. I'm waiting. Like, okay, get out of here. That's hilarious. Uh, and that just to me is like, uh, that reminds me of Aaron's kind of humor. Like, that's exactly yep. his humor. His timing is perfect like that. And he puts you in an awkward position. Like, you're like... He makes you just, you're like, is this guy serious right now or is he not? He'll take it all the way to the limit. He'll take it all the way to the limit. Like, I'm waiting. Like, yeah, you said you were going to do it. Let's go. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he's just so good about that. And that's what it reminded me the most of is that that really comedic way that he, he conveys his message when he wants to. It's just, it's such a perfect timing for me. Mm -hmm. I wonder if he like really got up for this episode like when he read this he's like oh man i cannot wait this is going to be so much fun or if he was just kind of like nervous like oh man i heard about these mirror universe episodes where you kind of have to be like a totally different character you know i feel like he would have gotten up for it i feel like he was like I this is so going to be fun I yeah i i know when he read the script he saw that he had two six foot girls on each side of him. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. he he was definitely up and he said he said he had a crush on one of them <laughs> So okay, so here's the inside I can't information. Which one? I think it was the one. With it wasn't the one, one he passed over to me. I think it was the one he kept on his side. I think so. I think so. <laughs> Melissa, it was the one with the what? What are you doing? <laughs> with the, you know, she had the thing, and then the thing, and the, the thing. <laughs> Her outfit. <laughs> you got to pay attention to the outfits, better, Ryan. You're I really don't. <laughs> I don't even know. I just know that there were two of them. Yeah. Yeah, he had one on his right, one on his left, but then he passes me uh, the one on his left. Yeah, the uh, one in black, and I don't think that's yeah. he had a crush on. I think it was the other one. The one with that's the things. Yes, <laughs> that was my guess. Yeah. Uh, but I loved the I loved the two tall line too that came in that moment. Hmm. It was pretty, it was pretty. And then I also like the moment where Jake feels like he just got busted by his dad because he's over there like. <laughs> Right, he's over there with this this girl that just got passed over to him, and then his dad walks in, and he's like, "Uh, I got nothing to do with this. Uh, just uh, stopping by. That's all." Another Dabo girl. <laughs> right. You know, right. I had forgotten 
what a relatively Jake centric episode this was. Um, it was really sweet to see Jake with his mother because obviously like he knows it's not really his mother, but it is the next best thing. It is one and one a, you know what I mean? Like, and that's just gotta be like such a cool feeling. It was like a really good idea to do that where he's just like saying, I I don't know how much time I have with this lady, but I want to just soak it up, have fun. She's so cool. She's just like mom. And it was really sweet. I'd forgotten that that was kind of like, you know, the almost like the main through line of the episode, you know? And I, I don't know. I, I really liked it a lot. I don't know if you remember shooting it, Sirac. I did remember shooting it. And I, I like the idea too. For, first of all, the woman that plays uh, Jennifer Cisco, she's so gracious. Felicia. Uh, very beautiful. Yeah, Felicia. Uh, so gracious, so gentle, obviously beautiful. But um, there were certain um, moments there that I too was like, oh, I'm glad that they got this done. Um, I think there was a moment where we were holding hands oh. and I was just looking at her hands. And um, even watching back as I was watching the episode, I was thinking how important and what that means to somebody to be able to just hold their hands and, and feel their hands in your hands. Mm -hmm. um, and that made me think, oh, this is a great episode because one of the things I do like what Deep Space Nine does a good job of is bringing back elements of the stories that they've already told so that you still remember those things. So obviously Jennifer Cisco is from the pilot, but then they also had an episode where she was this professor i forgot the name of this this is the like a second part of a two part right um actually it might have been Tarek nor but i'm not sure if that's the first part of this episode but the, the episode where cisco intervenes and she's a professor and we, we watch that and this feels like a continuation right. of that mm -hmm. so so they oh, just yeah, no, bring it's, it's all one big story arc for the mirror mm -hmm. universe yeah yeah right and that's what i like um, I like being recalled of these kinds of things that normally you do an episode, you move on, and then you never really get a reminder of that. So it doesn't feel like real life. If we all go and hang out and party in Vegas at the convention, that becomes part of our memories together. So we'll always kind of bring it up at some point on later on in the future. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like what they do when they storytell on Deep Space Nine is they bring those kinds of memories back to us in the in the present sense and you know moving forward so you get a reminder of those kinds of bonds and those kinds of relationships and those kinds of emotions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it it feels honest and i know at that moment when he was saying it look i never thought i'd hold these hands again i was like <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it got me um <laughs> but yeah. it's so true because it, you you it's little things that you don't think about that you didn't realize that you missed and then until something reminds you of it and they did that moment very beautifully you you and felicia did that beautifully <laughs> oh she made it very easy yeah too i mean because she is one of these people that is really gentle uh, very welcoming very warm you see how soft she is in this whole episode she doesn't come across to me as like a malicious person with with kind of ill will intent. She seems even even though she's setting it up and staging this whole thing to get Jake over there. And even that seems good intention and have a good nature behind mm -hmm. her. Notice behind it. Right. Yeah. And I really liked. I'm sorry. Right. Oh, no, I was just kind of jumping on that. Uh, that I really like the way the, the episode started, which was you know, on Jake at the promenade. Um, and it kind of gives us an idea. Well, is this going to be, you know, the B plot? A lot of times they like to start with like a B plot. And this, it kind of was in this episode, you know, uh, it was kind of intertwined with the A plot a lot, but it just opens up on the promenade, shows this big, beautiful set that we love. It's panning up. And then you see Jake in a spot looking down and my notes, I was like, oh my God, I love it already. Like, just cause it had like the big, beautiful set shows Jake in that special spot that we love so much and just showing him at that spot by himself 
without even any dialogue already gives us a feeling, you know, we're like, oh, there he is without his friend, you know, and it makes us think of Nog. It makes us think of all the times we used to see them there, including in the first episode where they just shake hands there, that fateful scene. So I was wondering if you, Sorok, when you saw that, did you kind of get the same feeling of like, ooh, this is going to be a good one. Let me just buckle in. Let me get a, get comfortable. Well, one of the things that I really like about watching uh, that opening moment is first they address the fact that I'm used to Odo kicking me out of that spot, right? Yeah. So there is, when I see him, I, it's like how you see that when, when Black people get pulled over by the police, that nervousness that you have, that's the feeling I have when Odo walks up on me, like, uh-oh. Odo's a might, cop, man. <laughs> yeah, so this might not work out well for me. Um, so that's just the, just right off top. He, I actually addressed that, and I said, I thought you were going to ask me to leave, you know? Um, and he's like, yo, I don't, just, I don't kick you out. I actually kick Nog out. He's the one that's causing all the trouble. You just happen to be with him. So I just like the fact that they addressed that, that a little bit, right? My tension and his actual, his, his intentions as well, Odo. Um, that I, you know, I kind of go into this sad moment, like, damn, I wish I did have some sand peas with me so I could throw yeah. them down to people, but I don't even have those because Nog used to supply those. You know, it's kind of like that, just like sadness about, I wish I, I wish I did have those moments again, mm -hmm. hanging out and throwing sand peas. But I did like the fact that what I said in that moment was, I'm proud of what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it came up, you know, Quark says, hey, you look so sad. You've been sad here for four out of five days or whatever. And um, and then he starts to say, I wish my son never, I wish my nephew never joined. I could have had a waiter, a better waiter. I could have had this and that. And I thought that it was good that Jake defends Nog's decision. And, and when he says, I'm proud of what he's doing, like, He's making me proud. He might not make you guys proud, but he's making me proud. Mm -hmm. um, even though I'm I'm suffering the most, you know, by losing my best friend, um, but I'm doing it because he's make he's he's making me proud, and 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 I'm I support his decision. So I just feel like another emphasis on uh, Jake backing his 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 best friend. Melissa, what did you think when they had that opening scene there? You, oh, or did, had you it. seen it had you seen it recently or did it just kind of remind you and come back no right? i watched it last night um just to get a refresher but um i love that scene between all three jake odo and quark because they all bring a different element of the story together without that missing you know nog element so um and and I wrote down that line too that you Sarak just mentioned. I'm proud of what he's doing, and I love that line. And uh, I like Quark's line after, um, where he says, "Remember that the next time you try to play a dom drop by yourself." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Funny. Yeah. But yes, it, it was such a strong friendship moment, and I love how Jake supports Nog and what yeah. he's doing. What a good friend he is. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I know what Sorok's thinking. When are we going to talk about the intendant? <laughs> I mean, you know, that's a whole you know, specialization. We're still, uh, we're still milking this one, you know, because uh, I do think that one of the things that reminded me this episode really had a baseline storyline of family. Yeah. And I felt like that's what this whole thing really was about. Like, in order to get Cisco over there, they needed family. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I feel like a lot of this episode, you mentioned being a Jake-centric episode. This is actually about Jake's family, you know, because Nog is part of Jake's family because right. his, his mom is there. Um, they don't get Cisco over there without Jake's family, right? And, right. and him, him feeling like, hey, this place is cool. Like, I, you know, I know it's not the same O'Brien and the same Bashir and the same Nog, but, you know, I think I can, you know, these, these are still my family. These are still my people. So I can, I can roll here um, until he realizes that it's not exactly the same, right? Uh, when, his family, yeah. really. It just looks like it's family. Good uh, enough. <laughs> right. 
Well, it's good enough, at least in the case with his mother, I think, um, because he didn't get enough time with his mother. You know, Jake is, right. this was maybe five years ago at this point in, in, in real time, or at least in the time that they're trying to portray on television. So I would say Jake has now gone through four or five years without his mother. So this means like a real, a whole lot to him. Right. You know, somebody who's not a hollow sweet program, somebody who's actually feels real in the flesh, somebody that they can give a hug to and has their own ideas that are not programmed into them. So I think yeah. that was special for him too. Yeah, he misses his mom, he misses his best friend, and he gets them both in one shot. He's just like, wow, this is so cool. I get everybody. Right. Yeah. And they both die. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <exactly. laughs> I mean, That's a whole other topic that we get into too. They man, both died. Uh, I feel like, you know, it's crazy because um, Jake has suffered the most the most out of any character I think you could probably mention. The, his, his story arc starts with his mother dying, ends with his father dying, right? And, mm -hmm. and then there's these, all these deaths in between, which is like he basically sees his father die in the visitor episode in front of him. Then he sees his mother die in this episode, even though it's not really her, but it's, you know, it's his alternate right. mother. So right. it's he like- He gets to uh, see his best friend and his best friend hates him <laughs> in this episode. Yeah. He's like, hey, buddy. And his best friend's like, get out of <laughs> right. here. <laughs> right. And he dies. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, and it's just like, uh, even in the, uh, in the documentary, what we left behind, you know, that theoretical death, it was like, why are you guys torturing Jake? So his mom dies twice, his dad dies twice, his best friend dies twice. And Which, you're right. Even when the series actually, is over, the documentary is still yeah. <laughs> screwing yeah. around. Well, which actually kind of provides evidence that maybe this is Jake telling these stories. Uh, so that he's the writer of these stories. Oh. Whoa. Ma <laughs> Mo, um, she's aggressive she is, she is. Yeah. okay moach <laughs> <laughs> yeah um can you get down now please i will say though that uh, <laughs> no, i do like that you know the writer of these stories but it's definitely uh something that comes up to mind i was like wow how tragic is that yeah <clears throat> that would be interesting if if they just kind of say it was all through jake's eyes you know the dreamer in the dream. The yeah. dreamer in the dream. Yeah, it's cool. possible. So we're going to take a break in just a minute here. Um, definitely going to talk about the intendant. I definitely personally want to talk about another new character to the Mary Universe who was Worf's character. Oh, Introduce yeah. somebody. I mean, they keep killing off characters, but they have new ones to bring in. You know, we saw Rom in the last one. Mm -hmm. uh, so that'll be exciting. There's going to be a nice, you know, dynamic between Worf and Garrick and the Intendant, certainly in the next one. Yeah. Um, but we'll talk about all of that very soon on the other side of this break. And uh, we'll see you in a second on The Seventh Rule. <laughs> 